You're welcome back. Well, 2023 elections present a unique situation for the average Nigerian voter to confront the issue of trust deficit among the political class. Nigerians have run out of patience in trusting their politicians and those who hold public office on their behalf. Nigerians hope that the 2023 general elections will herald a new dawn in electioneering campaigns dominated by issue-based debates while campaign promises are interrogated and situated within the current economic situations and realities locally and internationally in the hope that the best candidates win the election to deliberate or to liberate Nigerians with or without the cash crunch, uh, crunch with or without the problems that we are facing in Nigeria, we need a leadership that will take the people seriously. Now we're being joined by our guests for today, Mr. Shegun Shokpiton, Chairman Accountability, Kanda and Transparency Network. Good morning and welcome to the program, Mr. Shokpiton. Thanks for having me. We also have Comrade Eragbe Anselm, a Do Not 2023 senatorial candidate and national youth leader of Labour Party. Welcome to the program. Thank you, sir. Good morning, fellow Nigerians. A pleasure to be here. I like two things about politicians. First, the energy with which they take their campaigns to the grassroots when they are campaigning. And two, the faith with which they carry on these campaigns believing that they are going to get to the apex and they are going to be successful. I like the fact that your face shows that you still have that energy, you're not exhausted. First of all, how has the campaign been so far for you? Let me start with you, Com Comrade Arag Aragbe. Well, thank you, um, our host. For me, uh, it is what I'm used to. I am a grassroots politician. Uh, my style of politicking, for those who have watched me closely, is quite different. Uh, most times you don't find me running around cycles, but I engage virtually every day in the last 25 years. Now, what that means is I have been able to put in place over a long period of time in Nigeria a very formidable structure of young men and women uh, over the same course we are pursuing today in Nigeria. Uh, the rebirth of Nigeria, the pursuit of a new Nigeria that will work and function for us. So for me, it's all about structure, and structure is about people. So I've been able to connect with a lot of people over a long period of time who believe in a cause. So this is how it has been with me. Okay, well, so, when you mention the, the word structure and you belong to Labour Party, it comes to mind what people were saying before now. I don't know if that's still, still an issue now that Labour Party has no structure. But that's matter for another day or another time, maybe in the course of the program. But you have touched on the issue that we are going to be talking about now. You've been campaigning and that means that you've been giving a lot of promises. Before you answer the kind of promises that you've been making and everybody else who is campaigning, let me go to Mr. Shokbeton. You've listened, Mr. Shokbeton, to all, especially the presidential candidates in the forthcoming election. And by the way, that is just less than two weeks away. Uh, next week, we will be doing the run-up for the last time before election. And then the week after that, it will be something else that we will be, okay, well, the week after that, we'll be doing um, the run-up till Friday, and then there is something special coming up on Saturday, uh, this for the benefit of everybody else. We call it Ballot 2023. On the election day, everybody will be here and will try to x-ray what is going on, try to bring to the people whatever is happening anywhere in Nigeria, and there will be analysts in the house also that will be talking with us so everybody needs to tune in on that election day wherever you are because we are online and on site if you want to watch us okay now mr shopperton you've listened to the presidential candidates as they go about promising the people what are your takeaways especially as it concerns the fact that we've been hearing all these promises before now what gives you or otherwise the confidence 
that maybe this time around, the promises of the candidates might just come to pass. Okay, uh, thanks. Thanks again for having me. Um, I think that I, I like the approach that you um, asked this question from because really, this is probably one of the most uh, central issues uh, to this uh, election cycle. Uh, it's the fact that it, it will appear to be a battle between the old establishment, if you like, um, and 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 the and the new, you know, new input because that that is debatable. Um, now, the the experience of Nigerians has been, and that's why there's such a huge trust deficit between Nigerians and um, and the leadership of the country. Is that you know politicians come every four years and make promises, different promises, you know, some extremely outlandish and uh, some maybe not so much. And uh, the experience we have had over the years is, is that those promises never get fulfilled or get fulfilled in very uh, minimal measure, right? Um, and it would appear as though for, for a change this time, we have um, at least one candidate who appears to have a good chance of winning um slugging it out with the old order or the old establishment um so one will wonder how this will play out with regards to um the fulfillment of promises um so for me what this means is that nigerians have to um, interrogate the character the antecedents of the the the, the, the candidates on the ballot for the presidential um uh uh, seeds um, in terms of their character in the past how have they done with fulfilling past promises how have they done with performing you know in their public uh, service obligations how have they um, um, a, a acquitted themselves when it comes to the issue of the public trust um, how have they acquitted themselves with the issue of uh, say corruption uh, you know because these are the issues we're, we're dealing with I always say that we do not have a capacity problem in Nigeria. I have always said this. People tend to make out and give the impression that our politicians are stupid or they're dumb or they don't know what they're doing or they're incompetent. And I've always argued that I, I have a lot of friends, you know, people that I've known for years who are ministers, who are commissioners in different parts of the country and have, have known these people to be extremely cerebral and erudite. But they get into office and, um, you know, things change. Yeah, so, so, so you wonder that, look, this is not a character issue, um, pardon me, this is not a capacity or competence issue. This perhaps is a character issue and a systems issue. So it's important that Nigerians look at this, this uh, ballot as an opportunity perhaps to pit up that old order against the new. You know, let's, let's, we've heard the promises and the, uh, the failed promises of some of these candidates in the past. Is it perhaps a time to look in another direction and see whether, you know, if you give that other direction a chance, perhaps they will do better with uh, fulfilling, you know, these promises. I mean, for example, if you look at the manifestos of the three major parties, you find that the, the difference is perhaps not really significant. Um, a lot of them are speaking to this, the key issues that we have and the basic issues that we have and have um, solutions that are not really significantly different. So one of the candidates has, has continued to say that, look, it's not about the manifesto. It's about who will fulfill the promises that they made in those manifestos. So talking about promises, for example, the APC spoke very glowingly about the issue of restructuring in their manifesto in 2014. You know, it was very inspiring. And then they got into office and, well, you know, this is eight years later and we all know, we can all see where we are with restructuring under this administration. So that's just to give an example of when it comes to the issue of the feeling campaign promises and, and the performance of um, some of these politicians that are, you know, uh, jostling for our, for, our, for, our, for our votes today. So I, I would advise Nigerians to, wish, you know, in local parlance, shine their eyes. Oh, okay. Well, you touched on an issue that we might need to come back to, you know, the APC promises and what they have done so far. Uh, later on in the program, we'll have the opportunity to answer that. But let me go to uh, Comrade uh, Anselm. You have gone around making, by the way, my colleague is also waiting to uh, co also come in, but just take this one. Uh, you've gone around also campaigning and making promises. Why should the people trust you now? 
uh, more than they had trusted the people in the past. What do you think is the key thing in your own campaigning and your promises that will give the people uh, confidence that you really might fulfill these promises? Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, from the right way, Anselm, again. Uh, over time, we have seen politicians making promises to our people, promises not fulfilled. Now, again, for me, there could be one. The first thing is uh, trust. People do not trust their own words. That is one. Then two, the resources to provide, the goodwill to deploy the resources of nation in the interest of the people. Uh, basically, I'll be running, I'm running for the Senate. Now, the tax, our duty of the Senator is to make enabling legislation for the good governance and orderliness of the country. But we have seen a situation where uh, the legislators make laws to amass for themselves a lot of wealth, like we all know. But that said, their primary duty, having made laws, would be to oversight the executive to ensure that the laws they make are effectively implemented. Now, if you have made a law for the good governance of the country, for instance, education, for instance, road infrastructure, job creation, and there are votes for all of these issues, what they needed to do by way of promises made to their people, like for instance now, I have identified the need of my people. I'm from the Edo North Senatorial District. My constituency went down to the extent we have landmass, fertile arable land, we have body of solid mineral deposits. Like you are aware, in my own constituency, for instance, in Okola, which is in Isako, East, where I come from, is where you have the Dangote and the Boa cement factories, it's about the biggest in the country. So it just goes to say and to tell us the, the enormous or enormity of the endowment of the natural resources we have within my own enclave. We have iron ore, we have so many solid minerals uh, deposits. Now, I'm saying all of this because I know the, the burden and the pains of my people today. There's massive unemployment amongst the youth and of my people. Very massive. Um, my people are highly educated to the point where we have a lot of graduates who cannot find jobs. So, and this applies to the same, I mean, all over the country. So, for me, I have to say this several, and I'll keep saying this. I'm the National Organizing Secretary of the Academic Staff Union of Research Institutions in Nigeria, ASURI, over the last 13 years. Now, in the course of engaging, we went as far as sourcing funding for the research sector in Nigeria to develop key sectors of our national economy. Like I said, I led a team that secured 150 billion euros, for which we brought in the first 40.2 million euros 2021 that are stuck in Zenit Bank. So why I'm saying all of this, and I'll keep saying is to say, these funds are meant for the economic development of this nation and to advance education. So reverse engineering is the sure way to replicate technologies and to develop the space. So for me, this is what I've told my people. I'm not, I will not just be coming as a legislator, a senator who is going to sit in the Senate to wait for salaries, but I'll be coming as one who has sourced adequate funding for the entire nation for the rapid development and industrialization of this nation. So, Edo North Senatorial District is one of the 109 senatorial districts for which these funds are going to be deployed. Again, like we are all aware, the federal government of Nigeria's account is in the red. So, you need the goodwill of people to come and salvage this situation. For instance, God willing, by the time our presidential candidate wins, uh, because that's what we are believing God for now, we have worked tirelessly for that, the labor movement working with us and the youth of this country constitute the greater number uh, of the voting uh, population. So we are quite confident we'll win this election in the next uh, few days. But then our people are sufficiently mobilized in a do not senatorial district. So um, from this week going forward, uh, I'll be engaging uh, the strategy we have designed for the deployment of the vote on the election day, which is the situation room of the Labour Party. Uh, just a moment, uh, uh, comrade. 
Now, let me, let me rephrase this question. Um, using movie scenarios, I watch movies right. a lot. Uh, for instance, someone who has the interest of his family and the community at heart gets beaten by a vampire. Say, uh, if you watch vampire movies, and he knows that one day he's going to turn, and then he gives a silver bullet to a friend that, if, should I turn, use this and kill me so that I do not get to the stage where I get to destroy the community. I don't know if you get my drift. Now, no. they say power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. So, Bio and I were just talking the other time. Oh, not, not, not Bio now. Um, uh, Mr. Shokweton just said something about having a lot of friends who are who have the capacity and they do well, but when they get into office, things change. Now, what is that silver bullet that you're giving to your people so that when you get there and you're bitten by this bug that destroys capacity, destroys the goodwill that politicians have for the people before they enter into office, they can shoot you with? What is the mechanism, in other words, for accountability that you have presented to your people so that they can hold you back when you are getting the excesses that office holders in Nigeria, a lot of them get? Uh, basically, I agree with you. My desire is to dedicate even my own salaries uh, to education of our people. That is my first commitment to them. Uh, again, that we go to show that I won't be going to the Senate because I want to go and amass the wealth of the people. Then two, uh, the people have a duty and a burden for the call. Now, like I said, for me, uh, I will educate my people to this extent. I'm already doing that and I'll do that even while on the seat. The people always need to exercise their own rights and their powers to recall any of us okay. who is not doing well. Of course, there are procedures, but we ensure that our promises, the expectation of the people are met. Like I said, for me, my own salary should be dedicated to the education of my people. That is the first commitment. Mm. Then, two, to ensure that uh, I keep focus on why I go to the Senate. Because the, to make enabling laws for the good governance of Nigeria, you know, you talked about restructuring earlier. Maybe in the course of these discussions, I will say more things. So, our people, first and foremost, uh, need to be aware. They're already aware of the state of the economy, the state of things. Uh, we're in a very palpable and pathetic situation. Yeah. So we should not come in and aggravate this situation, but rather to ameliorate it in such a way that there will be, there will be dividends uh, for democracy, good governance, education, job creation. For instance, I'm already working on creating the first 10,000 set of jobs. I'm working with a team of consultants with the CBN to deploy uh, a program as it affects the, the, e, uh, the cashless policy. Okay. So we'll start from the known to the unknown. All right. So, you sound like a yeah. teacher. Known to the unknown is, is a phrase we like to use in the teaching profession. Okay, well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're talking with Mr. Shegun Shokwiton, Chairman, Accountability, Candor, and Transparency Network, and also Comrade Eragbe Anselm, a Do Not 2023 senatorial candidate and National Youth Leader of the Labour Party. We're looking at election promises, whether there's something, uh, there's something there for us to hope for or not. Um, we'll take a short break. When we return, I'll just hand them over <laughs> like that to uh, my colleague, Bayo, who is standing by to ask a few questions there. So let's take this break. And Bayo, when we return, they're all yours. Stay with us. You're welcome back. We're still talking with Shegun Shokwiton, Chairman Accountability, Kanda and Transparency Network, and Comrade Eragbe Anselm, a donut 2023 senatorial candidate and National Youth Leader Labour Party. We're looking at election promises, whether there is hope or no hope. And uh, uh, Bayo, I, I did say that when we return, I'm handing them over to you until I can chip in. I have a few questions myself, but I think they're all yours now. And um, I was enjoying the conversation, you know, and the, the, the exchanges, as, as it were. Um, I would like to start with Mr. Shokwiton. Um, if you look at the rate at which 
uh, political parties in recent time try to sell their manifestos, you get the impression that those manifestos where they exist are probably too complicated for the ordinary person. If, if you allow me, and I quickly go back to the Second Republic, uh, the late Chief of Bafa the, 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 manif the manifesto of his party, anybody will tell you what they were. Anybody. He had the four cardinal principles, free education, free health, integrated rural development, and the fourth one that I can't remember now. They so made it so simple. Uh, but now, with, the, with, the, with the, at least the four main presidential candidates, it's difficult to put a finger just off the cuff on what exactly they are selling. Do you think they've sufficiently marketed what they plan to do and the, the, the voters easily understand what they stand for? Okay, um, thanks, uh, Mr. Luake. So, um, it's a very, very interesting question and uh, it's deep and one has to think about it carefully. So. Um, I, I, I suspect that one of the challenges that we have now is that there is a there is a there is a disconnect between um, the manifestos and the intentions of the people that are putting those manifestos out, and I suspect that that might be why there is no um, very deliberate effort to simplify, you know, the messaging in those manifestos. Um, so, so I, I agree with you, and this 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 point you make, I have actually thought about it and wondered why we don't have from the the major candidates, even even some some the the ones that we consider not to be major candidates, the ones that are not foreigners, we haven't seen a clear deliberate effort to simplify the manifesto and push it out to the public in a manner that can be understood by even you know the the illiterate market woman selling tomatoes you know or maybe the illiterate organizer um the effort to, for example to translate those manifestos into um local languages you know the, the major local languages you know and spread them across i have had cause to raise this question with some of our political actors you know in in, in the recent times and, and i find that perhaps the reason for this is the manifesto is has become unfortunately has become an academic exercise. I gave an example for you know of the APC, for example, and the, some of the things that they said in the manifesto, you know, in 2014. I read that, that document and it was really beautiful, you know. But uh, what we have seen happen thereafter has been a far departure from the, the content of that document, you know. So I, I think that we as a people we may need to begin to uh, deliberately push the politicians in the direction of documenting their promises to us. What we now have as our political process, um, a bit different from that time that you, you described, you know, looking back into our history, you know, the 70s, uh, the, the, the Second Republic. I think what we now have is a situation where the engagement platforms between the politicians and the people have shifted from the cerebral um, uh, uh, places where, you know, the, 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 the content of their promises can be interrogated rigorously to so places where it's just a jamboree and all they do is just to say a few things to pander to the whims and the interests of their audience in those places. So we see more, more, more um, uh, the, the dominance of rallies. You know, the rallies happen all, and what happens at those rallies? They just dance, they abuse their opponents, they say a couple of things, they make a few tokenistic promises and they dance some more and they go home. And after that, they share pictures of the crowds that they were able to put together. You know, so I've had engagements, for example, online where people have been, uh, you know, disparaging each other over the crowd that they've been able to attract or otherwise. And the question that I've been asking the people that are talking about these crowds is, do those crowds vote? At the end of the day, crowds don't vote. It's individuals that go to polling units in their various localities that mm -hmm. to vote. So, you know, um, uh, shouting about the, the, uh, the volume of people that you've been able to gather and pull to party grounds should not be the basis of determining who is going to win. It should be, um, you know, who is connecting more with the people. And this connection, mm -hmm. I'm afraid, you know, has not been happening. And maybe that perhaps would explain why 
uh, we see this um, lack of lack of simplicity in in the in the messaging as far as manifestos are concerned and i think it's important that people you know especially nigerians ordinary nigerians watching us now understand the value and the importance of those documents those documents are the contract it's the only thing that you have that you can present three years into the into into the journey or two years or one year and that you yourself can review because we forget human beings will forget it's just our nature we're not computers right so that document is what you pick up halfway into the term and say look what did this guy promise us at the beginning and then you tick off against each promise and see how far they've gone so that you can then remind them hold them to account demand that they fulfill those promises if we do not get those documents in simplified forms then i'm afraid that the the likelihood is that the people putting them out perhaps did not intend to fulfill those promises in the first place yeah uh, thank, thank you very much uh, Comrade Eragben, um, I was quite impressed with your, with your involvement in research. Uh, and, but then um, when you uh, explained, you know, why you want to go to the Senate, I was actually looking out to see if you were going to say something about how we could use our lawmaking process to empower our research institutes. We have several research institutes in this country. I'm not even sure if they are operating as they used to. You have like NIHOT, you have CREAM, uh, in, in I think at those state, there's the one on rubber, okay? And the one that you are engaged with. We have so many research institutes working to either improve the species of agricultural yields or do some, you know, really good things. But then, we have not seen the impact of these institutes like they used to, to, to be. So I, I thought you might want to look at these and say to us what exactly you would use, especially given your experience. You will use your position as a senator to, to do for this research institute for the benefit of the country if you were to be elected. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, my first priority, I'm a researcher. Uh, and an engineer with the National Agency for Science and Engineering Infrastructure, NASEN. Uh, basically, our mandate is to replicate uh, technology by way of reverse engineering. Uh, we have all the facilities except for issues. Now, again, uh, if you are aware, the Secretary General of uh, the Academic Staff Union of Research Institution, Professor Tisian Dubuaku, uh, whom I ably assist as uh, the National Organizing Secretary. Uh, now, we have been on this in the last 13 years. Now, uh, we have been in pursuit of the National Research and Innovation Council Bill, in pursuit of it to an act. Now, the essence of that is to, once that bill becomes an act, because you are aware the President of the Federal Republic uh, inaugurated the Science and Technology Innovation Council uh, when he came into office, because he believed in the intention of uh, revamping the research sector. But somewhere along the line, his aides have not been able to make do with the bills that were passed at the point for correction for an act. So if we are in that struggle as I speak right now. Uh, there was even a demonstration to the head of service uh, last week to this effect. What the union is saying is getting fellow Nigerians legislators, high place Nigerians, uh, research sector to make impute so that we could have this bill become an act. So God willing, by coming to the Senate, that will be the first engagement, I believe God to engage so that this bill becomes an act within the shortest possible time. Now, you know, I said something earlier to say in the last 13 years, I led a team of researchers over the last 10 years before now, and we secured for the research sector in Nigeria 150 billion euro to fund the research sector because it is only through the research that Nigeria as a nation with its endowment and human resources can advance. So we know this, but we realize that without the enabling law, there is little or nothing we can do. So this is my first priority, ideally. We have over 250 research institutions in Nigeria 
the claim you mentioned, the freeing, uh, all of them, all of them. You see, the research sector in Nigeria is well composed, taking care of all facets of our national life except for funding. Talking about no, funding, no, no. sorry, so, sorry if I interject with you. Talking of funding, and, and thanks for the information about the uh, external source uh, funding that you were able to attract. But we also know that within the country, we have seen evidence that we can actually also generate. Take TED Fund, for example. TED Fund is a very buoyant source of funding. You know, why is something like that not being contemplated for research institutes? And what, why is it that we are also not seeing a synergy between our universities, existing research institutes, and the users of the product of the research? You know, I, I feel you, you could perhaps also look at this in your response. What yeah. piece of legislation can create this nexus, you know, between all of these facets for the betterment of the country? Thank you. Uh, very brilliant question, sir. Uh, you have put together very powerful questions. Now, NARICOM. NARICOM is what we call the National Research Innovation Commission, NARICOM. Now, that is meant to be like TED Fund. You know, TED Fund is tertiary institutional funding, but the challenge there is that fund is meant for blue sky research. That's the university's kind of research. You know, there are two kinds of research. The mm -hmm. academic research and the practical research to industrialization, which is where we come in. Now, they theorize in the university, but this third fund is meant to fund the tertiary institution, universities and the rest. And unfortunately, the research sector in Nigeria has not benefited. And this is the misnomer in that third fund, because those who created that policy deliberately estranged the research sector. So there will have been a combination of this sector, the university, the tertiary institutions, and the research institution sector. So that by the time we have the sky blue research, then we go to the practical approach to solving issues, which is the concrete uh, uh, research and development. Now, that is why the research sector, those of us in the research sector, came up with NAR, this, the, the bill I talked about, the National Research Institution Bill for an act. Now, when that act, when that bill becomes an act, embodied in that act is NARICOM, which will be at par with TED Fund. So NARICOM becomes the commission to implement the policy mm -hmm. for the research sector for development of research in Nigeria. So we have had this battle front and back with TED Fund and the administrators. So they, they explained us to a large extent it's not supposed to be so. So, in order for us not to continue in the unending fight, was the reason we had to do what we are doing now. So, I'm believing God, just like I say here, casually. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a deeply committed man to this cause. Uh, I bother to give an ally to say we have figured it out long ago. We have made all the propositions. We're in pursuit of that to the point of getting an act and its implementation. Okay. So, these are the issues and funding, which is always an issue, even for the nation now. These are a whole lot of things we put together over the last 10 years to 13 years now, and we, we, we were able to achieve this solution. Okay, Comrade, if I just uh, have one more question for Mr. Shokito. Um, at the top of the program, Yango made an allusion to the fact that when political parties uh, win elections and get to office, there's always a, 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 di a disconnect between promises that they made and fulfillment of those promises. And I begin to wonder, actually, is it that our political parties do not undertake research, you know, the word research coming up again now, <laughs> uh, as to the actual state of the finances of the, of, you know, finances available to government, uh, capacity to implement uh, and so on and so forth, you know, uh, to, to, to the extent that when they are now elected, where they even have an honest intention of executing, they find that there's a complete disconnect between what they have been anticipating. Do you think there's enough research being done, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the capability to implement uh, what they are, whatever they are promising, given the resource base 
of the country. Well, uh, the, a, a call came in and interjected us, but I will make do with the question to the best of my ability. No, sir, sorry, comrade. This is for Mr. Shopiton. If we have some time, we'll come back to you also for your own answer. Just, just uh, for Mr. Shopiton's uh, response. Okay. Thank you, sir. So, so basically, I, I think that there are a couple of issues at play, you know, with regards to this point that you have raised. Uh, for me, first and foremost, um, I I would not be, um, you know, disposed or predisposed to um, excusing the execution failures of our politicians on the basis of perhaps their lack of access to information and their lack of access to, you know, um, a, a realistic picture of the status quo and what, what they are going to meet on ground. I know that that is, 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 issue is, is real. It's on ground. Um, I know this because as you and, you know, everybody listening would know, um, transparency is not exactly uh, one of the uh, strong points of our, of our governments, you know, over the years. Um, get, gaining access to information, uh, getting uh, status updates with regards to um, what's happening in government and within the governance uh, space. It's very difficult. Even with the um, enactment of the Freedom of Information Act, um, we, for example, in my organization, Accountability, Candor and Transparency um, Network, uh, we have made repeated several um, engagements and interventions with different um, MDAs over the years, looking for information about specific projects, um, looking for information about um, you know processes that governments have been through uh, in executing some projects, and we find that the response has always been a pushback, uh, and we find ourselves confronted with a situation where if you really want access to that information, you'd have to go to court to try and enforce the provisions of the FOA. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I recognize that access to information is a problem. However, having said that, I think it's important for um, us to acknowledge and recognize that also that governance is serious business. And um, seeking to, to govern a country as big as Nigeria, 200 million plus people, um, a GDP hovering around $500 billion. You know, it, it's no joke. It's the biggest economy in, in Africa. Every um, out of every four black people that you meet anywhere in the world, one of them will be a Nigerian statistically, you know, to step forward and say you want to govern, you know, a, a, a country this big must mean that you, you are serious. It must mean that you are well resourced. It must mean that you are experienced. It must mean, it must mean that you are connected, you know, in the governance space. And that's where the issue of experience comes up, you know. So you have to do your homework. You know, you have to have gone you know, whatever connection, whatever uh, means you are going to use to try and determine, for example, what is the state of the treasury of the state that you want to govern? You know, how much money do they have? What is their revenue stream? What is their IGR? You know, so at the federal level, have, have our candidates that are currently seeking our votes um, done an extensive study of the revenue profile of the federal government, aside from, you know, what happens at the federation level, but of the federal mm -hmm. government. Where, what are the key revenue sources? What are the key expenditure uh, expenditure heads? How you know how 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 is the funds flow happening? Because if you haven't done that homework, then like you said, you will get into office, you find yourself overwhelmed with situations that you didn't anticipate, and you find yourself hampered by an ability or otherwise to deliver on those promises. So for me, you know personally and for my organization, speaking for my organization as well, I know I speak for us. We will not take that as an excuse. We do not. We always say that people should go into this venture mm -hmm. prepared, prepared to deliver, armed with the required information and ensuring that they can deliver when, when they do arrive, arrive on board. So, okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Uh, comrade, now your turn. You, you, you want to give a perspective on this. Why is it when politicians get to office? There's a big disconnect between what they promised and what they are able to deliver. Um, is it a product of not having done their homework? Yeah, comrade, just, just uh, very briefly because uh, we're running out of time. Very briefly, please. Muted. He's muted. 
Uh, we can't hear you, comrade. Uh, sorry about that. I was muted. Sorry. Uh, okay. Most times, briefly, please. politicians don't even get to read what is written. So, uh, even most times, again, when they make promises to the people, they just say these things uh, offhand. Uh, somebody come to the people, I will do this. First and foremost, they don't even look at the policy document. First, they, they, are, they are manifesto, party manifesto. What does it say? How many people have read their party manifesto in the four sisters? So first and foremost, politicians must learn to read. Having read, they need to understand. Now, they go towards the policy direction of the party and work towards its realization through implementation. So, for instance, uh, the ideology of the Labour Party, social democracy. What does it mean, really? Now, this is a welfare, a social welfare state, uh, the way it is. Education, as it were in Nigeria, basically should be free. Should be qualitative, should be compulsory. Now, the ideology of the Labour Party is towards productivity. It then means we must be able to engage the mass of our people through productive engagement, agricultural mechanization, solid mineral mining, then build their capacity for productivity through education. So as a party, we must engage the education of our people. We must provide healthcare services to our people. We must be able to engage the mass of our people productively. So these are the policy direction of the party by way of a manifesto. So. And for some of us, fortunately, by God's grace, I'm a researcher, I'm an engineer, I'm a research engineer, I'm a metallurgical materials engineer. So I'm trying to know the wealth of nation and how to put the wealth of nation to use. Okay, okay comrades, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for that perspective. Uh, Yamgu, back to you. Yes, yes. Uh, well, we, I, just, I just wish we hadn't run out of time, uh, but uh, this is how much we can take from our gentlemen uh, so that we can go for the news break and when we return it's you and i bio so i'd like to use this time to thank you mr shegun shokweton chairman accountability candor and transparency network thank you so much for coming on the program thank you and comrade aragbe anselm a do not 2023 senatorial candidate national youth leader labor party thank you so much for coming on the program and good luck at the polls uh, thank you, sir. Okay, so, First TV. Thank you, sir. Start yeah. the we'll take this break now and get the news. After the news, we'll continue with the run-up. Stay with us.